Amazing. So, hi, I am Ryan Brown, and I work at Ansible full time. Um, you might know me. The audience here might know me from serverlesscode.com or serverless.zone. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about Ansible as a deployment tool, which our previous speaker might really appreciate. <laughs> Um, what we're going to be talking about is the philosophy behind Ansible, why it's designed the way it is, and what it's for normally. And then we're going to talk about how to use Ansible for cloud resources and specifically for use with serverless applications and how to mix it with other tools. And then we're just going to go over a state of where Ansible's going with serverless. Um, Ansible is designed to be the simplest possible deployment tool that works. And what that means is that it's not a full programming language. You write YAML templates that define tasks, that compose into playbooks, that do your job for you, and then you can go home. So what that means is that you can extend automation to parts of your organization where it's not all programmers, it's not all, um, all DevOps team members, it's people who are traditionally network operators. It's people who are in finance. It's people that want to just restore their own backups. So you can provide them a playbook that'll restore files just based on a parameter that they give. Um, and Ansible works on two different layers, kind of. If you uh, were to make a stack, you'd see on an instance is one layer of the stack, and then everything outside an instance is another layer. And what that means is we define that as configuration management, which is sort of provisioning and everything that happens on an instance. So moving files around, moving, um, moving services up, or taking services up and down, installing packages, rolling out your application, all that kind of stuff. And on the higher layer, you have orchestration or uh, orchestration of other resources. So that might be your cloud provider, so dealing with AWS to provision instances or dealing with things that go, the concerns that go across instance. And that would be things like a rolling deployment. If you have some kind of a red, uh, red, blue, or a, sorry, red black deployment, then you would use Ansible to manage deploying first to the black set of instances and then moving traffic over by talking to the load balancer, talking to whatever third party services that you need. Uh, the other thing that we realized really early in the Ansible project is that people aren't starting their business today. Uh, people have legacy applications, they have uh, other tools running around in their environment, and they're really unlikely to bail on everything that they've had before and move over to your new tool. And that's true for serverless, and that's true for Ansible as a tool. And so Ansible is designed also to work really well with other things that you bring along. And that's part of the reason behind the, the agentless architecture of Ansible. What agentless means is that we also like to suffix things with less. Um, it's just a really great, great way to start, uh, start a Twitter hashtag. So what that gives us, though, is the ability to go across OSs really easily because we don't have an agent that needs a fully functioning Ruby install with 5 million gems to template out a file. And that means that we, we do Windows, we do Linux, we do BSDs. We also do AIX, if any of you are in a combination AWS and AIX environment, which I know is popular. Um, and that also means that things that you can't SSH into and that you don't have full access to are really easy to bring under the Ansible umbrella. So third-party APIs like cloud vendors, like appliances that sit in your data center, like things that go across your data center and public cloud, um, networking hardware, so that means your Cisco, Juniper, whatever switches and routers that you have that are keeping your organization running right now, uh, you can actually make that repeatable and not have your network engineer hand configure every artisanal switch config. It's great. And for security mitigation, that means that you can use Ansible as a way of orchestrating rolling restarts and things. So if you have a Heartbleed-like situation, you can write two Ansible tasks and send it out over your infrastructure and have it find all the vulnerable machines and then patch them as needed. Uh, for clouds, we support every major cloud provider and a lot of non-major ones. Um, if you have any of these, whether that's hosted OpenStack or not, obviously you can have it in your data center or you can go with hosting provider. And we have modules to support resources in all of these. 
And this is just something I wanted to bring in as a tip, which is using dynamic inventory with third-party providers. So if you have, let's say AWS, and AWS knows everything about your infrastructure already. And you don't need to repeat that configuration. You don't need to bring that into Ansible manually. You tell Ansible, here are my AWS credentials and here's what regions I'm in. Or just check all the regions. And Ansible can go to the cloud provider, which is basically the source of truth for what instances exist. It's your CMDB when you don't have a data center. But Ansible can use dynamic inventories to go out to GCP or Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, VMware, wherever you're running compute now, Ansible can go out and get that inventory and then bring it in. And so you don't have to duplicate uh, configuration there. And as I mentioned about bringing other tools, this is actually valid Ansible that will run Puppet on a machine that you have, which is kind of cool. Because if you have a bunch of Puppet that is already written and already out there and you have a team that's good at writing Puppet, you can leave all on node orchestration for Puppet and bring in Ansible to that higher orchestration layer that I talked about earlier. So Ansible is dealing with provisioning your load balancers, your routers, your switches, everywhere that Puppet can't reach, basically. And you can continue using all of your Puppet configuration on instance, and Ansible populates Puppet's Hyra data with facts from its inventory or facts from your cloud provider, if that's the source of truth for that data. And so this will just pass some facts and tell Puppet what environment it's in, and you're off to the races. Um, now we're going to talk about some implementation patterns for Ansible with serverless. And the first one is one that I kind of stumbled upon, not entirely expecting it to work, but it actually works really well with the new serverless v1. And the reason that it works so well is because serverless v1 is based really, really heavily on cloud formation. And as you know, cloud formation is a nice language for specifying AWS resources, and it also has a great API. So that dynamic inventory stuff I mentioned earlier, you can use to grab any resources serverless has provisioned and use them in things that you're deploying with Ansible, or flip it around the other way and have Ansible provision resources and then make them available to serverless in CloudFormation. So you can split up your ownership of different resources um, so that you don't have serverless owning a bunch of VPCs that you would really rather your network team be in charge of. That's okay. And it also lets developers keep the really nice serverless workflow while they're working there. And then when you go to deploy, it just works right in with the rest of your deployment system. So you can deploy to your data center, to your instances, and uh, deploy anything that you've written with the serverless framework and have that be a smooth process from whatever CI or CD system you want. And so this is just a, an example of kind of both ways that you can move CloudFormation data. You can create a CloudFormation stack and use the export values and have serverless just import them and use that. And that's just a way of having a resource that Ansible controls that then serverless is allowed to use. The other way is using facts, which finds a stack that exists and pulls in all of the resources and outputs and variables and all of the events, so the event log and what's been happening into Ansible so that you can then use it to deploy something to another provider. So if you have services that depend on your serverless framework or on your, on your serverless application, you can pull out all of the endpoints because those are all available in CloudFormation and already there. So the source of truth is the actual item and then you're pulling that and putting that into wherever else you need it in your infrastructure. And uh, this is just an example with the new YAML uh, syntax, which Ansible is also YAML, so you can have nice unified editor configs. And then uh, this is um, what it looks like when you're using a serverless deploy module. This is not in Ansible yet. I'm working on it, so it'll be in the following release of Ansible. And these are just the same options that you would see on the, command, on the command line tool for serverless, but it's giving you much better output than just the serverless standard out stuff. So it's doing a little bit of parsing smarts and a couple other things so that you can, again, just thread that back through to the rest of your infrastructure. 
And uh, you can specify functions or just have it deploy all of them, obviously. So, And uh, this is just sort of a way of thinking about when you're using the serverless framework or if you have legacy infrastructure and you're thinking about it, just things to pay attention to that I have found to trip myself and a lot of other people up. Um, paying attention to who owns resources. So if serverless accidentally deletes a stack uh, that it owns, does that break other services? And it might delete endpoints that would break other services, but if it deletes shared resources where you have those IDs being used somewhere else, so if it tries to delete a VPC that other services are using, maybe serverless shouldn't own that resource because it did just get out of beta. Um, you have to think about your data locality. So if you have data sources that are in your actual data center, you have to pay attention to latency between those. Um, latency is a pain point that I've found a lot with serverless applications, just because adding API gateway and Lambda starts and all that just adds you know, a couple hundred milliseconds that I'd rather not spend. And uh, about coupling, I talked about deploying. Um, make sure that you also think about rolling back. So if you are halfway through a deploy and you've deployed your black server group and then the serverless deploy fails, make sure that your Ansible playbook doesn't ignore the serverless failure and deploy anyways, because that is a great route to pain. Um, and like the previous speaker said, keeping data formats within one function is nice if you can get away with it, because that means that if you do have to, uh, if you do get stopped halfway through deploy, either the new format is in use or it isn't, so it's an atomic change. And then uh, Ansible can be used for templating as any config management system can be, but you can use Ansible to template out YAML files by just passing in a dictionary of data, and you can define the format of that. But when you are able to template out variable files, that's a really good way to send data from Ansible back into different serverless stages and regions and things. So Ansible can go to the sources of truth for all of the right data that you need, and based on all of that, assemble a serverless variables file, and then your serverless uh, deploys have exactly the most up-to-date data uh, about the existence of everything in your infrastructure because you have all these different third parties that you might be getting stuff from. And uh, this is the more obvious one, which is all in for Ansible on serverless framework. We have right now support for a bunch of event sources and AWS Lambda, but if you're on other providers, we don't have a lot of function as a service stuff for you, I'm sorry. Um, what's nice is that if you're using Ansible already and you are happy with that, then you can use all of the things that you've been used to, all the variable stuff, all of the support, all of the facts, all of that, and bring that just along with you into the serverless world. And you can integrate with existing playbooks, just like we talked about, um, but the problem is, is that this is not a super mature model because there are so many event sources available that we don't have modules for all of them. So this is just a really simple function that I, that I have in an existing playbook. And this looks a lot like the serverless function definition because it's a lot of the same parameters. But trust me, this is valid Ansible. It executes. Um, and you can use uh, variables that will be pointing to the right ARNs. And the zip file parameter, you'll notice, you can actually use Ansible with a CI tool or a build system. So if you have an Artifactory or a Jenkins install, you can have Ansible just hook right into that and then grab the zip file and populate it there. And so the idea is to be able to use Ansible as a glue between potentially a lot of disparate systems that just grow up over time in any company that's been successful enough to continue existing. And uh, then this is just one of the event sources that we have, which is CloudWatch events. So you can set up the CloudWatch cron setup and send out this email report every day. And Lambda just rolls that up and sends it out to MailChimp or whatever provider you have there. And uh, this is actually all you need to deploy this Lambda, as long as you have a zip file and a role. And uh, then it'll just start executing. Um, the downside of this, this is the least, what I would consider the least mature model for Ansible with serverless because of just the lack of coverage of certain event sources. And this is all going to be coming out on Monday with Ansible 2.2. And we don't have API gateway support, which um, is a big showstopper for honestly a lot of serverless deployments, but that's something that we're working on. So we have a 
module that's in a PR for Swagger support. And so that'll cover that in 2.3, which is going to come out in another couple months. We do pretty frequent releases. So expect to, uh, expect to see a lot more of us, I guess. Um, this is just Jeff jokes. I don't know. <laughs> so like I said, look for our 2.2 release, which is going to be coming out on Monday, and our 2.3 release, which is going to be a couple months after that. Um, in 2.3, we're going to have the serverless framework module, API gateway support, more event sources. So basically look for Ansible to continue doing what it's been doing with cloud providers, which is just expanding event support, expanding uh, integrations. And if you, if you run a fast platform, come talk to me, and I can help you get your module to be a part of Ansible. And just a final reminder is that you can use tooling that you have for serverless applications, and that maturity is uh, improving you know, every release that we get. And then I expect other config management tools to also be doing stuff like this. And if they're not, they might be missing the boat. So thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on Twitter for questions. Uh, I'm not going to take questions right now because I am out of time. But uh, I will be at the social tonight, so you can find me there. <laughs>